Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I uh, am told that I was, uh, my time slot was put up against Brexit, which I guess everyone wants to know what Theresa May is going to do. Certainly, I can appreciate that. But I want to thank you all for coming in here. Um, my interest in blockchain and intellectual property all started because I was late. What does that mean? The German-American Chamber of Commerce put on an advanced manufacturing symposium, and we were discussing uh, cross-border manufacturing, digital manufacturing, and Industry 4.0, and I was actually helping to put on the conference, and I walked in after it started. Fortunately for me, Aaron Frankel, who works with Siemens, was outside of the room looking at his emails. He and I struck up a conversation, and what I learned from Aaron is that Siemens is very interested in digital manufacturing, Industry 4.0. Advanced manufacturing, essentially, is a process of uh, additive manufacturing. It's a new manufacturing process. It can be controlled across continents, across cities, and the point of it all is that you are adding into the manufacturing process rather than, for example, cutting down a tree, stripping down the tree of its component parts, and then adding value to that board. So what does all this have to do with where you're here today? Because Aaron asked me to think about how we could put together the digital thread in the advanced manufacturing process and protect their intellectual property. My name is Trip Lake. I'm a partner with Lewis Brisboy, Bizgarden Smith. And talking today about IP, blockchain, and the digital thread. So what Aaron asked me to do is he asked me to think about a use case scenario. How can we use the digital thread to protect their intellectual property? So the problem with advanced manufacturing, and really any manufacturing, is that once you send it out, it being the design, the prototype, your idea, whether it's on a USB, whether it's in a digital packet attached to an email, whether it's a physical prototype, it's outside of your control. We do NDAs, we do confidentiality agreements, we try really hard to make people promise, cross their heart, hope to die, that they will not use your ideas and make those for sale where? Anywhere. So I was thinking about this, and I had a client, we'll call him Alex, and Alex makes office furniture. He makes cubicles. So he's got the posts, and he's got a rail running across the post, and in that rail, he has um, uh, power and data cords. And these things are about as easy to put together as IKEA furniture. So he had someone come to him, a potential customer, and they said, look, Alex, this is terrible. We've got to put together hundreds of these things. We have a day to do it. We can't do it. Come up with an idea for us. And Alex said, I got your idea, but I need you to promise me that you won't take my idea over to Asia and have them manufacture it for me. Because not only do I design these and engineer them, but I manufacture them and I sell them. And my promise to you is that I will give you the exclusive use to sell these under your brand name, but you'll buy them from me and I'll make them. No problem. Signed a contract, signed an NDA, signed a confidentiality agreement, and then as soon as they had a prototype, they took it over to Asia and had it manufactured over there. There was no digital manufacturing here, but it was a, an advanced manufacturing process. They did use 3D printing to create the different pieces. So instead of an IKEA furniture piece, it was like those big Lego Duplo things that a two-year-old can make a castle out of, right? It was just that easy. And they were able to reverse engineer it, create CAD drawings, create engineering specs, and they went gangbusters, made all they wanted. Alex didn't see any of it. So I'm thinking to myself, well, he's using part extruded aluminum, so part traditional manufacturing, part digital manufacturing, what could Alex have done? So what he could have done is he could have recognized that in 3D manufacturing, in Industry 4.0, we can make anything. We don't need to use any extruded aluminum. That's a Callaway golf club head, 3D printed. This one is a uh, motherboard that's got all sorts of 3D printed manufacturing in it from the silicone um, all the way down into the fans, etc. And this actually is the engine of a new Cessna airplane. And most of the parts in that engine are printed. There are 
companies that are printing airplane wings in the battlefield with mobile 3D printing devices. And what they're doing is they're taking all of the information necessary to create a golf club or a Cessna engine, compressing that into a digital packet. It's got everything. It's got the CAD drawings. It's got the engineering specs. It's got the materials specs. All of it is right there. Obviously, it doesn't all fit on a USB drive, and certainly we don't hand out USB drives to our engineers or our manufacturers, but that's all transmitted over the web. And across the cloud, we can do this. The, uh, uh, an engine manufacturer, a vehicle engine manufacturer in Morocco can make um, parts of an engine in China, parts of it in Morocco, parts of it in the United States, all sequentially monitored by the engineers in Morocco, have it sent there where it's finally assembled. What does this have to do with blockchain? Well, anytime you, Alex, anyone, sends information to somebody, there's risk. You've got intellectual property tied up in that data packet, your trade secrets. Patents, not so much, because the patents are traceable. They're public anyway, except that use of your patented ideas can be subject to a license, and that can be stolen via, three, via third shift manufacturing, gray market, we'll come back to that. And so ultimately what we're worried about is piracy. And Alex suffered piracy because um, he didn't have strong enough protections surrounding his ideas. He had his prototype, he gave his prototype to the customer, and the customer simply took that and had it copied. What could he have done? He could have put that prototype in a 3D digital model and sent that off to the customer. That prototype could have been encrypted that prototype could have been protected, and here's where blockchain comes in. And keep in mind, blockchain isn't by itself sufficient, but it can be a really important tool in keeping your data safe because blockchain tracks connections. Now here we step back just a little bit and we think about what blockchain is. Blockchain is remarkably simple because it sounds like exactly what it is. It is a chain of blocks. Each person who accesses the data has to, under this, circumstance, under this scenario, add a hashtag into the chain. They add their digital signature into the chain. So we're not talking here about opaque blockchains, like with digital currency, right? We've got digital currency, Bitcoin, whatever it might be, where anonymity is the key. With digital manufacturing use case for blockchain or any kind of digital encryption technology, you have an open ledger so that everyone who is invited into the ledger can see everyone else's use. What does that allow you to do? That allows you to track the connections and it allows you to monitor permissions, right? So if Alex had sent his CAD drawings over to the customer in the form of a digital file, the customer had had to digitally sign a contract saying, I won't use this or let anybody else use it before they were able to access and decrypt that file to see what it looked like, then anyone else who would have tried to use that digital file would also have had to sign the contract. And they would have had to have permission to sign the contract. Without permission, without signing the contract, you don't get to open that file, you don't get to see how to make the device, you don't get to use it, and you certainly can't send it to a third party. And here's the kicker, if you do, Alex knows exactly who's seen it. But everyone's been invited into this shared ledger, and ledgers have been around since the 15th century, dual ledger accounting systems. This is simply a digital version of that. You've got a multi-level, multi-layer accounting of who accesses a digital file. So enter the smart contract. I talked about that Moroccan uh, automobile manufacturer. They want to send the CAD drawings for part of an engine into China. I told you I'd mentioned China because China is kind of the boogeyman for United States manufacturing. In 1993, they passed their first intellectual property law. In 1998, they revised it and actually tried to start enforcing it, but not until 2018 have they really made substantial progress. And one of the reasons that they've made substantial progress lately is because they've realized that they need to start outsourcing information, outsourcing data to, grow, to continue to grow their economy. But what that's done for us, who may want to go to China in order to 
have things manufactured is it's created a desire for transparency. In fact, Xi Jinping, the premier, um, recently talked about the need for transparency to continue to grow the Chinese economy. That makes them more willing to accept this kind of open ledger transfer. So we send the digital file attached to a contract. The contract is signed, the contract is able to be uploaded, and the, the 3D printers are then able to run. They run off of what is on that digital packet of information. And that packet can't be sent anywhere else. And here's another cool thing about that packet. You could program it. So if you want to have 500,000 of these guys run, you have 500,000 runs and no more. And so if that manufacturing plant wants to run three shifts, one 8 to 5, one 5 to 8, the other one 8 p.m. to 5 or 8 a.m., and they want to keep the ones that were made over, uh, overnight and sell those into China and give us the 500,000 we contracted for, they can't do that. Because as soon as they hit 5,000 pieces, the run stops. The program re-encrypts, and you can no longer run that digital manufacturing process. And you can use blockchain to control it. What does that mean? You can track. You're able to track exactly who uses it so that if the IP is stolen, then you can go back and figure out who has it. And you can prove, which Alex unfortunately is having a hard time doing, that it was given under certain circumstances. It was given to the third party manufacturer under the express condition that they signed off on that they wouldn't share it outside. And you can prove that they did that. You can limit the number of uses. So you're able to actually prevent additional uses. We talked about the gray market manufacturing. Um, and so uh, you're able to limit the runs of that manufacturer. And you're able to verify. And verification here is key. Because at the back end, in China, in Morocco, in Denver, if you're not going to be able to get away with the theft, it makes you much likely to want to steal that. So then, if we have all of these use case scenarios and we want to pull together a manufacturing process, what can we do? We can have Alex put all of his data in the digital thread. He can then create a digital copy so that actually, when it's used to make a rail, that fits in with those posts, he's able to actually see here in Colorado, because of the speed of the internet now, with, especially with 5G, 5G's decreased latency, he's able to see immediately every time that process is used and is able to have a counter going. He's able to track it. Now, digital manufacturing is great for a lot of reasons. <laughs> Protecting your intellectual property is just one of them, but also, once that digital manufacturing limit is, uh, is reached, again, he can either shut it down remotely from here, or he can shut it down from a uh, natural process that's built into the software itself. And so when he's going, to back, going back to try and enforce it, one of the big problems that we have is proving where that intellectual property went. Again, we're able to track that intellectual property such that we can prove that Alex's customer actually did send the file over to the manufacturing company in China because he can't access that without a block being removed from that chain. And when a block is removed from that chain, that actually also can be used to shut down the manufacturing process. And he can see where that block went because there's a digital signature attached to every single use of that chain. So in the end, Alex is going to be able to better track the rails. The company in Morocco that builds, manu builds automobile engines, they're able to be better manufacture, sorry, better able to track each individual part. This can be applied not only to manufacturing, it can be applied to financial transactions. It can be applied to um, uh, employee contracts going around the world. Employees sign contracts, you verify that they've signed the contract, and then you verify that they've complied with it in terms of their transmission of information around the world. And so 
part of the use case of the intellectual property with the blockchain is exactly that. You're able to track, you're able to limit, and you're able to verify. I went a little faster than I did in my head, but I want to thank all of you again for showing up. Hopefully, you already know everything you need to know about, blockchain, or about uh, Brexit, and so I thank you for coming over here. I do want to open it up for just a couple minutes of questions, if anyone has any. Yes? How does this prevent reverse engineering? And that is a, um, uh, so two ways. One, you can't reverse engineer the digital file without adversely affecting the digital file. So in other words, if you take that digital packet out of the smart contract and try to make a copy of it so that you can then go back and deconstruct the component parts of, let's say, the CAD drawings, let's say, the material specs, et cetera, then um, the owner of that shared ledger, who is also seeing every transaction that involves that digital packet, sees it happening. And if you take the digital packet of information out of the uh, blockchain, then it shuts it down. You can't use it because it re-encrypts. As for reverse manufacturing of Alex's physical process, well, there's some practical, some real world uh, actions that Alex has to take. He has to say, if you want to see the prototype, come to my office. I'll send you the digital prototype so that you can see what it looks like. If you want to make design changes, if you want to make engineering changes, et cetera, we can talk about that. He can control that use. And then he just controls the physical use of his actual prototype by having them come to his office. And then they don't take it with them. But they don't need it to manufacture because they don't need the extruded aluminum. They don't need the example parts. It's all tied up right there. And actually, there are very few human, humans involved in manufacturing the actual factory floor manufacturing anymore. Does that help? They are. Um, Siemens, Honda, GE, um, I mean, I could go on and on. Yes, sir. In what way is the blockchain technology really helping enforcement out there? Is it really stopping this IP theft, and is it really becoming uh, an important tool on getting remuneration? So, yes. Um, in a uh, copyright matter, actually, in China, and I forget the court specifically, a US owner of a copyright shared a, a news story that was picked up by um, Chinese uh, uh, news uh, services. I forget which one. Forgive me, it's been a while. But, there's, but they were actually, they used it without permission. And they actually ran advertising, and they made quite a bit of money by picking up this story. So there's an intellectual property court in China, in this particular province, I think it was in Changsha, where they were actually able to go, and they took the blockchain, and they, they ran um, log files off of the blockchain, and they were able to actually show all of the use. And because they had a shared le ledger, and it was a transparent ledger, so it was public among the use group. And they were able to show that the file had been taken out of the chain. They were able to track the IP address and the other um, uh, identifying information of the user who took it out. And they matched that up with the end user and were able to show that to the court and were awarded damages. If I were to talk about Alex's example, Alex's problem is that he can't track who sent the, the, the prototype out for manufacture and reverse engineering. If he could track that, then he could take that information into a court, and so long as he could demonstrate that the, that the uh, digital file hadn't been tampered with, so show a chain of evidence, then he would be able to show the court that in fact this person who promised by signing the smart contract not to share this with a competitive manufacturer did and then that competitive manufacturer actually used that file to compete. And so, absolutely, it's a, it's a really neat tool for enforcement. Yes? Uh, I don't know if you said this at the beginning, but are there certain companies or third-party providers who you would work with to provide Absolutely. And um, I, I got the, the idea from Siemens, um, who's using it. Um, but there are 
a, a huge number. And actually, I, I know and have worked with one particular company in San Francisco. I'm happy to share with you in the 10 minutes between this and the next presentation because I have one second left. Thank you very much, everybody. I really appreciate you coming in on such a beautiful morning, and I'm happy to answer any questions after.